Are you having a good time? Are you having a good time today? How'd you enjoy this morning's panels? I have the distinct honor and privilege to introduce last year's competition winner who has been making important strides in the wealth building and technology community. Miss Angel Rich, CEO and founder of The Wealth Factory, raised in Kingman Park, DC, in a life insurance sales family. Uh, Angel grew up listening to financial pleas from every walk of life, igniting her passion for financial literacy. Rich graduated from Hampton with six honors, including honors college status. She became a global market research analyst for Prudential conducting over 70 financial behavioral studies to learn how to systematically modify financial behavior. In 2010, Prudential CEO requested Rich to conduct Obama's Veterans Initiative research, and in 2011, Rich conceived the first African-American financial experience study. National media recognized it as a groundbreaking study, identifying it as the first financial services study aimed at understanding the financial perspectives of blacks and it now serves as a benchmark across the industry. In 2013, Angel Rich successfully founded The Wealth Factory, and by 2014, she gained national stature with the Charter Schools Development Corporation, becoming a member of the DC Chamber of Commerce and was featured in the Washington Post Capital Business section. She also won the March of Dimes Rising Heroine of Washington, and in 2015, she conducted the Financial Empowerment of Urban Youth uh, program and gained uh, recommendations and citations from the U.S. Department of Education and earned the support of uh, the, the, the White House and one Industrial Bank Small Business Competition. Now, something that you should know, she won last year's Inclusion Revolution Innovation, Innovation Competition. Since that time, we have been in touch with each other. And can I tell you that she puts the H in hustle? Now this woman, I, I am just amazed and astounded at her energy. Uh, and when I say that she puts the H in hustle, I mean with a capital H. Uh, she, uh, she recently completed a new book that I was happy to actually write the forward for. And that book was called History of the Black Dollar. So with that, welcome Miss Angel Rich. Thank you, Dr. Maya. I am so incredibly humbled to be here today. Um, I have to quickly tell you all about uh, Dr. Maya. When I asked her to write the foreword for my book, I had been actually hesitant for weeks. I kept restarting the email, and I was like, man, I really would like her to write this forward. And I asked her to write it, and do you all know she sent it back in two hours? <laughs> As if she had been thinking about it her whole life. And it was so good, I almost was like, can I even publish this book? Like, oh my gosh, this is, I don't know if I can live up to the fort. And so, um, <laughs> for real, I really paused for a moment. And so, um, just thank you so much. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. So today, I'm gonna to take you on a expedited journey through the history of the black dollar. Essentially, I wanted to write this book um, because of a lot of the questions that the gentleman raised earlier. How do we bring together the baby boomer generation and the millennial generation? I felt as though that the older generation didn't quite understand the newer generation, and the newer generation seemed to not have a clue about our actual history. I guess I don't need a double mic. About our actual history. And so the way I was able to comprise the book, it takes you from slavery all the way till 2017 and explains the economic history of black America. In between each chapter, we focus on a civil rights leader or women lead, a women's rights leader of some kind. And then we also have some type of rising black tech entrepreneur as well as uh, Aaron Horn McKinney alluded to earlier. So. There is no mystery that the slave trade was an economic institution. Starting in 1619, slavery served as the nucleus for racial and economic injustice. By the mere nature of slavery, blacks were prevented from earning wages and whites were able to capitalize off of this. A lot of the main staples included tobacco, 
hemp, cotton, all types of things that we were forced to do, wheat. But by 1850, cotton was king. Slaves usually only received about one or two pieces of clothing each year. I'm reminded of Booker T. Washington and up from slavery when he talked about having to put on the burlap slack, uh, sack and his brother would even wear it for him first because it would itch him so bad and he would have pains all over his body from having to wear this burlap sack. They were usually also just fed grits. If you received a piece of meat with that grits, you were living life, okay? Um, Harriet Tubman once got in trouble for stealing a, a sugar cube off of her master's table and she was caught before she was able to actually put that sugar cube in her mouth and she was uh, punished for that. But what people don't know is that the power of the black dollar actually started in 1621, a few years just after slavery. Uh, a group of Virginia blacks were able to earn enough money. Some slaves actually uh, got paid by their masters. Not m much money, but you know, a dollar here and there, that type of thing. And so they would save this money. And this group of blacks in 1621 was able to purchase some land and they started selling their own tobacco and rice. Then by 1700, blacks actually started partnering with Native Americans and learning their language. Now, everybody say they got a little bit of Indian in them. Guess what, we really do. <laughs> so, <laughs> we really do. And um, so with the Lewis and Clark expedition, people don't know that Williams Clark's slave actually led the Lewis and Clark expedition. And that's another reason with Sacagawea that we have her intertwined in our history. So there's a very deep history with Native Americans and blacks. Also, people don't know that I found very interesting. I, re I eat a lot of oysters. Did you know that it was a, actually a couple in 1736 that was the first to take oysters and sell them in uh, Rhode Island? So seeing a budding economy, Richard Allen and uh, a man named Mr. Jones started a black community for the Free African Slave Society in 1778. Following that, Mr. James Norton created a niche market for himself, becoming a sale maker. This was after uh, and during slavery, um, not after slavery, after he was able to become free, or actually I think he, um, I'm corrected, he was free already. His father was a, was a slave and he was born free. So, but despite these advancements, blacks still remained in the harsh chains of slavery. And from 1805 to 1860, there was a well-established market for blacks. Now, raise your hand if you have not read the Willie Lynch letter so I can shame you publicly. <laughs> the Willie Lynch letter was a letter uh, written by a slave master uh, that he performed it at an event that they had every year where they would come together, kind of like a conference like this, and talk about the best way to control your niggas. And so he got up and he said, in my bag, I have a foolproof method for controlling your slaves. And he talked about controlling them by age and color and light skin against dark skin and old against young and all of these various different characteristics that we still fight each over to this day. To this day, we're divided by these things. And he said, if used properly, they will last 300 years. And guess what they have? So slavery actually started to dwindle out a little bit um, by the mid-1700s because of the Revolutionary War. They thought that it was going to come to an end. But good old Eli Whitney, a slave himself, created the cotton gin. And because he created this cotton gin, it suddenly spawned from having a quarter million blacks as slaves to four million blacks because they now needed to be able to funnel the cotton that was coming out of America. America became the most capitalistic society in the world because of slaves and the cotton. We had the cheapest and best cotton in the world and we were developing it for free. Moving forward, we take ourselves to this very place of the nation's capital in 1791 where DC was officially formed because of two lands merging together for Maryland and Virginia. There were a lot of free slaves in DC as masters died out and different things of this nature. Next thing you know, half of the black population in DC were slaves and eventually it got under were free and eventually it got to be three fourths. So of course they had to do something about this. 
So they integrated the black codes. The black code said different things like, you can't be out past 10 p.m. or you're gonna be fined. The $5, the equivalent of now $75. Then they kicked it up a notch. If you can't pay the fine, we're gonna whip you. Then they took it an even step further. If you can't pay the fine, we're gonna put you in jail. And in order to get out of jail, you're gonna need three signatures from three upstanding white people saying that you're cool. And so, and then you needed to have some type of job in order to prove that you are contributing to the society and that you are uh, gainfully employed. So it's a, it was a complete cycle that kept people within the prison system and then had them um, working sanitation for them. And that led to the invention of uh, convict leasing. So during the Civil War, and this is what made me write this book, Harriet Tubman was the leader of the black Union troops. Slaves first started making money in 1861, and they were making 63 cents on the dollar. When Harriet Tubman and the other troops found out about this, they were livid, and they refused to accept their wages, and they continued to refuse to accept their wages until they were actually paid. Now, they never actually received <laughs> equal payment, but what they at least requested was retroactive pay for those that had been enlisted in the Army before the Civil War ended with the Emancipation Proclamation. Harriet Tubman, however, felt as though that still wasn't good enough, and people don't know that Harriet Tubman refused to accept wages until her 90s. Harriet Tubman was broke when she was, uh, um, when she was an older woman and ailing. The reason we even have a book on Harriet Tubman is because she didn't have any money and her next door neighbor wrote a book on her in order to provide some money to her family. So I think that that is very important to note because do you all know what blacks make on the dollar right now in 2017? 67 cents on the dollar. So you trying to tell me in 150 years we've only moved four cents? But the difference is that group of people refuse to accept their wages. We take it and smile and ask for the next check. And therein lies the problem. Therein lies the problem. Moving forward, we enter sharecroppers' economics. Now, sharecropping was just another form of slavery. I don't know how many of you uh, saw the screening last night that Dr. Maya did. It was beautiful. And sharecropping was basically a way for blacks to still have some type of employment, um, using the skills that they were accustomed to, but be able to do it in a family system. So the whites were actually comfortable with this because they felt as though they had created some type of incentivized scheme for people to work in groups. So they liked the fact that people were still grouped up together and they could kind of control them in, their, in that masses. At the same time, while blacks had more autonomy, at the end of the day, they still kind of wasn't making any money because they would have to work off of credit. They would get charged exorbitant fees for this credit. Uh, they would take their uh, crops whenever they wanted to and use them however they wanted to. And if they did not yield the crops that they were supposed to, they would actually be fined and have to pay the master or whoever they were working with for that. So as blacks started to make money um, through sharecropping, uh, they found it important to create the Freedmen's Bank. And so many of you are probably actually familiar with Freedmen's Bank. Uh, President Lincoln started the Freedmen's, well, he didn't quite start it, but he signed it into legislation. And it became the end of his demise because five weeks later, they assassinated him. Anytime blacks try to get up in economics, something happens. And I'll speak to that in a little bit with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. Once Freedmen Bank pretty much essentially went bankrupt. Um, there was a lot of fraud in, involved with it. They called in Frederick Douglass. That's the reason we have the Frederick Douglass House over in DC. He himself put 10,000 of his personal savings into it and it still went bankrupt. And they basically just shut it down. They owed blacks $3 million at the time, which would be the equivalent of $100 million today. 
and that money has never been given back to blacks. Talk about reparations, how about the money we had, okay? So being extremely upset, blacks started to move across the country with the Great Migration. I'm proud to say that my great-grandparents were actually a part of this. Um, yesterday, they talked about some of the first blacks moving to Levittown in 1957. Uh, fortunately, my great-grandfather, John D. Sister, passed for white, worked for the government, and he bought a home in 1947 in Kingman Park. Kingman Park is the first neighborhood in America that black affluents were allowed to move into. It's situated right on the water at Anacostia Park. I'm working on getting it into the museum now. And basically, they built this neighborhood, but whites didn't want to move into it, so they uh, crafted an advertisement that said, only the finest of blacks can live here. And so you literally have one of the first black millionaires that live in that neighborhood. Black Wall Street. <laughs> black Wall Street actually started in Richmond. A lot of the banks were started in Richmond, the black banks. Uh, it led to the consolidation of a lot of them, and they called it Consolidated Bank. It was later on sold to Premier Bank. Moving forward, there was one that started in Tulsa, Oklahoma. That is the famous kind of Black Wall Street where the Black Wall Street riot happened. Being upset of the amount of wealth that these blacks were making, 40 uh, blocks worth, they called the riot because they insinuated that a black man had raped a white woman when, in fact, even when they asked the white woman had she been raped, she said no, but they still rioted anyway because they wanted to destroy Black Wall Street. Ever since Black Wall Street, blacks have yet to gain that amount of economic independence that we once had. That dollar circulated within their community 36 to 100 times. It only lasts six hours now. Six hours is how long the dollar stays in the black community. And that's insane. That, that really has to change. And so while I could go on and on about this forever, obviously, because I wrote a book about it, I would like to encourage you all to go to Amazon.com and purchase History of the Black Dollar so that you can have this knowledge for yourself and share it with your family and your community because it's important for us to know our history and where we came from. This conversation of the future of wealth has been happening since the 1600s. So why are we still in the same position and have only moved four cents? So I would just like you all to join me in reducing poverty and increasing wealth distribution. And while you're doing it, download my app, Credit Stacker. It's on Google Play and iOS. Thank you.